A while back, I read a paper which detailed the findings of a recent excavation at a site in Mali called Galsani, which I found to be particularly interesting. While reading the paper, my respect and expectations for the early cultures of the Western Sudan have been dramatically raised. The goal of this video will be to try my best to summarize the bits of the study that I found to be most interesting. While I did my best to summarize and condense the interesting and important bits of the article, the script of this video still turned out to be long and detailed in the end. Now because of this, I know for a fact that I will bore a lot of people, so I apologize in advance for this. As done in some of my previous videos, to make it easier to digest, I broke this video up into separate topics which are listed in the order that they will be presented. The topics will be the function of the site and its dimensions, the chronology of the site, the diet or subsistence economy of the inhabitants, the material culture, the ethnicity of the inhabitants, and finally the trade networks. So here we go. Mamadou Sis and others did an archaeological survey of the Galsani Mound and they published their findings in the Journal of African Archaeology. Galsani is a medieval archaeological site in Mali, which is thought to be the historic town of Sarne, one of the dual towns of Galgal -Gal of the Gal Kingdom, described by Al Mulabi in the 10th century, as well as the dynastic center from which the 12th through 13th century Muslim kings and queens at the nearby cemetery ruled. The settlement mound of Galsani is a whopping 32 hectares. This archaeological survey provides new information on the function of the site the subsistence economy, material culture, spatial differentiation, and chronology. This research also highlights the significance of its participation in trade networks that stretched all the way to Egypt, Tunisia, Spain, and the Middle East. Along with Ghana, the Gal Kingdom was a considerable regional power, which was characterized by the Arab geographer Yakubi in the 9th century as, and I quote, the greatest of the realms of the Sudan, the most important and powerful. All other kingdoms obey its king. End quote. In the year 985 AD, the Egyptian chronicler Al Mulabi wrote of the two towns of Galgal -Gal and described Sarne as a market town and another royal town which contained a mosque and a palace where the elite lived. Presumably, the palace was the locus of the king's treasures. Reports by Al Bakri in 1067 described a population that was still pagan and was ruled by a Muslim king and that salt was used as a currency. There are other early sources for the history of Gal, which are oral traditions, the Timbuktu chronicles of the Songhe Empire, such as Tariq al-Fatash, Tariq al-Sudan, and finally, the grave markers in this kingdom. Between 1972 and 1978, Colin Flight surveyed the cemetery and conducted an, an excavation of nearby sites and uncovered several fired brick structures. During this excavation, he hoped to find the royal palace of the Gao elite, and during this search, he found and mapped out, mapped out the foundation of a massive building that had been covered in white lime and red plaster that was still intact. The evidence that Gao was primarily residential and elite has been expanded by other excavations. These excavations have revealed Two extensive buildings in stone, which are adjacent to the previous building, and both of these buildings appear to have a complex construction and use history, with lots of evidence for multiple building phases. The smaller of these two buildings is constructed with schist slabs and has a central room measuring 5.5 times 7.9 meters with eight stone pillars. Radiocarbon dates from the floor level of the central room gives dates from the 9th to the 10th centuries for its construction. Five dates of the overlying deposits have given dates from the early 10th to the 11th centuries. Two rooms on the southern end of this building have been excavated, each measuring 3.1 times 2.2 meters. Treasures of considerable quantity have been found in this building, such as over 6,000 glass beads, an iron sword inlaid with brass, fragments of imported lustware, several dozen glass bottle fragments, copper-based objects, and two small gold fragments. All of this is reminiscent of the findings documented on the Swahili coast.
In the 14th century, Africa's Swahili coast was an exotic place, described by Arab sailors as vibrant and affluent, with the most beautiful and well-constructed towns in the world. This was the setting for the legendary adventures of Sinbad and the Arabian Nights. Persian carpets were exchanged for African ivory. Porcelain was traded for gold. Merchants who came from India and Arabia, even from the Far East, had to deal with Swahili brokers, medieval middlemen, who were their only link to goods from Africa's interior. At Galsani, the evidence of manufacturing debris, such as crucibles, slag, and crescent-shaped copper ingots, have prompted some researchers to conclude that the town was a manufacturing center, like the historic town of Sarnet. In nearby trash pits, other manufacturing debris such as melted glass, iron, and copper were found, as well as fragments of banco bricks. The earliest levels currently excavated at these sites give a calibrated date range of 680 through 980 CE, which suggests an initial settlement of around the 8th century CE. Within a very short time, the extent of the area currently surveyed was 300 meters east to west. In short, the current chronology for the eastern part of the main Gal Sandy Mound is between 700 and 1100 CE. Over 140 seed, fruit, nutshell, and other botanical fragments were identified. The dominant domesticate is pearl millet, which accounted for more than a third of the seeds recovered. Rice was also found as well as the bones of cattle, caprines, and fauna. Along with the domesticates, a range of Sahel-specific tree fruits were identified like boabap, desert date, jujube, as well as some edible species of wild plants like grains of false sesame. Surprisingly though, despite the fact that this site is located next to a river, very few fish were found. All of this hints at the possible diet of the population. 809 copper-based artifacts were recovered, and of these 809 copper-based artifacts, more than 400 were pieces of copper crescents. Due to their limited shape, it has been suggested that these were used as currency as well. If researchers happen to find patterns of standardized size and or weight categories, this idea will have robust support. The fragmentary condition of these crescents, however, make this difficult to ascertain. Also, 54 additional copper items were identified which included rings, wires, vessel fragments, rods, nails, and bells. The leftover 350 pieces were unidentifiable bits of copper sheet. On the upper parts of the excavated levels, 150 small copper crucibles were found, and many of them had greenish vitrified residues on them, which suggests that coppersmiths were engaged in the smelting and casting of iron in this site. The current isotope analysis and plasma mass spectrometry data for the copper crescents suggest that Tunisian ores are a strong candidate for the source of the metal used to manufacture these items. Similar data drawn from other sites in Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Nigeria suggest the same thing, although isotopic analysis of the copper wires and sheet metal indicates likely sources in Morocco. Two separate excavations conducted in 2001 in 2009 recovered 800 glass beads, two-thirds of which came from the lowest occupation levels, dated to the 8th to 10th centuries. One quarter of the beads were melted, malformed, or unfinished, and most likely represent glass manufacturing debris. 168 vessel glass fragments, most of them unidentifiable, were recovered. Most of the beads were blue and green in color and shaped like thin cylinders or oblates, and shaped by drawing and cutting a glass cane. The large portion of remelted beads and fragments suggest that the beads were reheated to smooth and round out the cut ends. The earliest glass, which was found in Mesopotamia, was produced using soda plant ash. Various shifts from soda plant ash and mineral glass occurred in the Mediterranean and Middle East throughout these regions' history. But by the 3rd through 7th century CE, soda plant ash was used in the Sasanian Empire. Now knowing this, if the Arab invasion caused the fall of the Sasanian Empire, 
the Muslim expansion may have served as the catalyst for the diffusion of soda plant ash from the Middle East to the rest of the Mediterranean, which made it the dominant type again by the 8th century, which possibly diffused to West Africa. Plant ash soda lime glass has been found in many West African sites, such as Jene Geno, Gao Ancient, Es Salk, Kisi, and Igbo Ugwu. Mineral soda glass has also been reported in Gao Ancient, Igbo Ugwu, and Es Salk. Other imported goods include carnelian, possibly carnelian beads, cowries, which came from the Indian Ocean, and granite grinding stones. Researchers have also found 11th through 12th century Spanish lustware. Some historical figures claim that Gao Saini was settled by North African Berbers during the second half of the 11th century, but very little evidence supports this claim, and the ethnic signature provided by the pottery provides evidence for a local Niger River-based population. It matches the first millennium CE assemblage found along the Niger River, the Timbuktu region, the Ansango region, the Benchia region, the Gao region, and surprisingly, the Lakes region as well. Some variation may exist, but the prominence of red, black, and white paint without red slip remains constant, and pottery excavated in this region was dominated by a single vessel type which were organic tempered jars with long funnel-like inverted rims decorated with broad parallel channels. Polychrome pottery is present in West Africa, farther from the river, in the first millennium, but relatively rare at Es Salk, Akumbu and Mema, Orsi Village, and Kisi Three in Burkina Faso. Polychrome pottery in Gao Ancient or Gisani doesn't appear before the 7th century, but it appears in Koima. It also appears in the Niger Delta and Lakes region up to Timbuktu in 100-300 CE, and at Tumbuze around 100-650 CE. Another possible regional ancestor for Galsani has been identified at Orsi. At Orsi, pottery and Iron Age sites dated to around 100 BC to 200 AD shares a matte impression motif with Gal. From the evidence, it is clear that the Gao Saini assemblage differs a lot from early polychrome pottery of the Lakes region and Niger Delta area. Areas likely to have been inhabited by the Monde speaking Bozo in Sonica. It is also different from the pottery found on sites occupied by Berbers, like at Esalk, for example. At Esalk, the most common pottery type in the later portion of the first millennium CE are large undecorated jars and painted decoration is rare. While the community at Gao may have been heterogeneous, containing a mixture of Songhe and North African merchants and travelers, the earliest ceramics was stylistically homogenous throughout the early period. This means that either not much cultural exchange or influence occurred at the beginning, or that the North African merchants and travelers came later. The same ceramic styles created by the artisan merchant population at Gao Sani was used by the elites who began to construct the pillar structure at Gao Ancient at 900 CE. Insaw, in his pioneering 1996 paper, showed a complex urban configuration that went further than the two-town dichotomy of the historical archives. The urban configuration consisted of multiple heterogeneous communities in which religious allegiance, political power, and economic power were distributed according to unknown patterns. These patterns remain unknown due to the limited sample excavated from the site. The evidence from Sani situates the site within an extensive trade network. The presence of similar pottery near Timbuktu, Gorma, and Benchia clearly show river-based cultural exchange along the Niger River. Gao Sani joins the growing number of archaeological sites that document a fast increase in the movement of exotics interregionally between the Sahara and the Sahel and the Sahara to North Africa. Thirty years ago, discoveries at Jene Geno of locally organized regional and interregional trade networks in the western Sudan shows that this practice predates the trans-Saharan trade. The large evidence for the manufacturing of glass beads as early as 700 CE from a likely glass source in the Middle East suggests that the demand and trade for glass was well established by that date. 
These glass beads are regularly found in graves dating from 400 to 1000 CE at Kissy, which is composed of soda plant ash. One of the beads was found in the grave. They had a calibrated date of 5 BC to 430 CE, which shows the early movement of glass. In Tumbuze, the glass beads were found in levels that dated between the 2nd through 7th century CE. The beads at Kishi had a chemical composition that was similar to the beads at Gao Sani, Gao Ancient, Esalk, Mirandit, Azilic, and Igbo Ugwu. Segmented glass beads are found at Gao Ancient, Esalk, and Tegdaust. Over 200 fired glass segmented beads found at Gao Sani appear to imitate the beads mentioned previously. Segmented clay beads are also found at Kisi. The test for the source area by chemical composition of the carnelian for the carnelian beads have been inconclusive so far, but the case for local bead manufacture from imported carnelian is indicated by the presence of carnelian debitage at Gao Sani. Some of the beads could likely have been imported in finished form though. The sources for the flint and granite grinding stones were available in the drawer des Ifagas. Other imported items have been found at the lowest levels, which means Gao was participating in long distance trade from the beginning. The sheer quantity of copper and glass, plus the evidence for the secondary processing at different periods, is consistent with the sector involved in crafts, trade, and the marketing of imports. Supporting the identification of Sani with the historical 10th century trade town of Sarne. Based on the data, it can be said that the eastern region of the Niger was involved in long distance trade by at least 400 CE. And by around this time, a very large copper trade network had developed, which extended from North Africa through Mirandit and later the manufacturing centers at Gao, which went south to Igbo Ugwu. Among known sub-Saharan sites, the scale of this trade was exceeded only by Igbo Ugwu.